money mic check so i'm in here for the various topics late night bill with the late night bill and i'm gonna go over these topics first before i go over any small talk so appreciate any anybody present but we gotta go over history today even though i got so much to talk about from tiktok uh, the president of Russia, um, you know, just a whole lot of stuff is going on in the media. And like I said, especially on TikTok. TikTok is a hot because it's under threat and scrutiny of being a non-American company. So I'm your host, CEO, and author of First Book of More, PNF Supreme Leader so shout out to you if you know me and you checking in and uh we have a returnee and a returnee reward of the month so to inside it only the why return fee of the month because he said he was gonna come back if i do the live video late night and he came back shout out to the one and only if you want to go and get some good wisdom, that good midwest oracle wisdom, matriarch wisdom, go over to Yasani in the house. Oh, and what else? The one and only Hope on Hill, the Safari Warrior Prophet and Spirit, support her brothers, endeavor of keeping the prophet out at front. Hope on one of the Originators. And I don't know if you know Hope on L. Sister Cassandra Zorn has passed away. That's right. I wish I had some theme music for this special occasion. But Sister Cassandra Zorn or Georgia Peach passed away. I don't know if y'all know that. But a uh, moment of silence for that sister. She was critical in our community. <laughs> yeah. So. I want to go in here on Ramona Edelin and talk about this story right quick and get a briefing on her. Let's share the screen so we can get to the bread and butter of this video. Oh, I love you too. I love you. I'm freaking the love this year. You definitely indicative of my work. You showing up support me is proof. It is one. Okay, uh, let's put the screen up. Hey, y'all, we got to go over there. This is real event in America. And I know it's a lot going on. I don't know if I shared this. I hope I did. But some of the video, I know it's late night. And we don't, you know, we haven't been consistent over here. But I'm monetizing my video. So we're going to be consistent now. Let me get to this background. I want to get to the background. Let's use uh, this line here. This is better. Let's use that. And we'll go from there and keep it smooth from there. We'll keep it smooth. Okay, is that good? I like that. Let's, let's use this one. Now we'll go back to that. Okay, right. So this, this is a neat background right here. I like that. So let's chop it up with Ramona Adelin, who helped popularize the term African American. And this is on the Washington Post. It's on the Washington Post. 
Ramona Adelin, as you can see, she kind of resembles Michelle Obama. Same type of eyes. But she's an important figure that, uh, you know, we don't really know about. We know about Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and, you know, African Americans. But Ramona, she helped popularize the term. She was an academic term activist who helped popularize the term African American in the late 1980s through her association with Reverend Jesse L. Jackson, and who later helped make charter schools a dominant force in D.C. education, died in February 19th in her home, Washington, she was 78. Her passing, which was not widely reported at the time, was confirmed by Barnaby Towns, a communication strategist who worked with Dr. Edelman and caused with cancer in the Raised during the tumult of the civil rights movement, and she was ostracized by white classmates at school, Georgia and Illinois. So she went through it in Georgia and Illinois. Dr. Edelin went into academia with encouragement from her mother, Annette Lewis Benazzi, the first woman to earn a doctorate in library science from Columbia University. She was the first woman to point Columbia. Dr. Edelin went on to receive a PhD in philosophy, writing her dissertation on civil rights activists, W.E.B. Du Bois, and helped launch the Afro American Study Department at Northeast University in Boston in 1973, serving as the program's first chair. Under her leadership, the department soon changes things to African American studies. Embracing language that had circulated among the scholars but was seldom used by the general public. So, this looks real. You know, this is the pic right here. Doesn't That's the young Jesse Jackson, 1989 African American Summit. It's the continent and the, the, the U.S. territories, North America. So, the ideal of this, Jesse Jackson pretty much gets credit for it, but there's other leaders who was responsible for coining the term African-American, and it probably was around. They had been using it already, but what was the purpose of African-American? They were looking for an identity, a political identity, so Jesse Jackson could run for president. And we can read through this. It's worth reading to get to know Mrs. Adeline. Miss Evelyn, uh, to get to know her a little bit, it's worth reading this little passage right here. It gives us more connection to what they were thinking and doing. But first, we got to understand Jesse Jackson was on a political scene, not the local scene. So let's let's go and read this, and it'll help us develop more conversations on something we didn't know about. So she was ostracized by her. Classmates in Georgia and Illinois, Adeline went into academia with the encouragement of her mother. Had a PhD in philosophy, philosophy after her dissertation on W.E. Du Bois. Now, they changed the name to African American Studies, embracing language that had circulated among scholars but was seldom used by the general public. That began to change more than a decade later when the term African-American was adopted by 75 national black leaders, which should be in bold face because we don't necessarily know what a black leader is and what uh, certifies them to be. And the leader for the 1988-89 gathering called the African-American Summit, okay, the meeting was convened by Jackson, the civil rights leader, okay, and formal presidential candidate who embraced the term African-American and was widely credited with inspiring its widespread usage. Okay, now I get it. By all accounts, he and other black leaders in the group decided to adopt the term at the suggestion of Dr. Adelman, who had traded scholarship for advocacy and was leading the National Urban Coalition, a Washington-based nonprofit. Now, how can organize this summit? Dr. Adelman argued but they should refer to themselves as African Americans instead of black. The term of a historical concept, she said, that linked black Americans to the global African diaspora. 
The idea called on and she told the Boston Globe you could feel it at the, at the December 1988 news conference. At the December 1988 news conference in Chicago, Boston, yep. and the Dr. NAACP leader Benjamin Hooks, civil rights activist Dolores Tucker, and former Gary Indiana Mayor Richard Hatcher. Just as we would call colored, but we're not that. And then Negro, but not that. To be called black is just baseless, he said. Adding that African American has cultural integrity and puts us in our proper historical context. Keyword, us and our. Weeks later, the New York Times published a part story reporting that many African Americans agree with that. The time has already shown up in the newest grade school textbooks been adopted by several black running radio stations and news papers around the country and appeared in the titles of popular books and in the conversations of many blacks as they warmed to the idea and speak of visiting Africa one day, wrote journalist Isabel Wil- Wilkerson. There were still plenty of holdouts. Some critics found African American too wordy and worried that it was less powerful than black which evokes memories of the Black is Beautiful campaign in the 1960s. Others dismissed the name change debate as a distraction, saying that it was far less important than issues like unemployment, drug addiction, and economic inequality. For years, polls showed no strong consensus around the use of Black or African American. Both terms remain in widespread use. As Dr. Edelman saw the question of terminology The, the question of terminology was more than a name. Calling ourselves African Americans is the first step in the cultural offensive, she told Ebony. Magazines linking the name changed to a cultural renaissance in which Black Americas, Americans reconnected with their history and heritage. Who are we if we don't acknowledge our motherland, she asked in a separate interview, adding that when a child in the ghetto calls himself African-American, immediately he's international. You've taken him from the ghetto and put him on the globe. This is her at her office in 1996, Washington headquarters of National Urban Coalition. Dr. Edelman's interest in economic and educational histories deepened during her years at the National Urban Coalition, which she joined in 1977 as an executive assistant to M. Carl Holman, the group's longtime leader. She succeeded him as president and chief executive, leading the organization from 1988 to 1998, while overseeing programs that included a STEM initiative to promote math in science education, especially among children of color. Her work led to appointments on educational panics, panels and civic task force, including as a member of the president's board of advisors on historically black colleges and universities during the Clinton administration. She also served for four years as executive director of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Charter school advocate, Dr. Edelman, a longtime Washington resident, emerges leading champion of the city's charter schools, which are publicly funded but independently run, starting with a handful of schools and a few hundred students in the late 1990s. The D.C. charter system is now one of the largest in the country by percentage of enrollment, with nearly as many children as traditional D.C. public schools. Without her leadership, it's safe to say that the charter school movement in the United States and certainly the nation's capital would not be where it is today. Ariel Johnson, the head of the D.C. Charter School Alliance, wrote in tribute. So without Edelman's leadership, it would not be where it is today. Dr. Edelman was a senior advisor to the group which succeeded the D.C. Association of Charter Public Schools and now the Buck advocacy organization that Dr. Edelman led and as executive director from 2006 to 2020. 
critics charge that charter schools deprive traditional public schools of money and resources and lack the financial transparency and accountability of neighborhood schools. Dr. Edelman argued that the charter system offered much needed alternatives for families, including in low-income neighborhoods, and saw the system as an avenue for social justice. He were social justice. A way to create opportunities for quality education for all students, said her friend Linda Moore, the founder of L.C. Whitlock, Whitlow Stokes Community Freedom Public Charter School. Dr. Edelman champion charter schools and interviews and opinion essays including for the washington post through the dc charter schools association she also waged a years-long legal battle against the district alleging that the city was illegally underfunding charter schools because of the way they split education funded a federal judge sided with the city in 2017 although charter school leaders including moore and donald l hemp say that edelman's efforts led the city to expand its support for charter schools so at least it helped to that degree. Ramona was steadfast and always sitting before the city council, making sure that the position of families and children was foremost on the mindset, hence. The founder and chairman of Friendship Public Charter, one of the city's largest charter networks. Appropriately enough for a former teacher, her style was diplomatic, not combative. He said, more than anything, she was a stabilizing force. Ramona was not a confrontational person. She led by intellect, to be honest. She always sought the very best out of people. She never ever came back angry or upset. She always looked for the best. Ramona Hogue was born in Los Angeles, September 4th, 1945. Her father, George, died in a motorcycle crash. Weeks before her birth, and the family later moved to Atlanta in Carbondale, Illinois. Wow. After graduating from high school at Stockbridge Progressive Boarding School in Western Massachusetts, she received a bachelor's degree in religious and philosophical studies in 1967 from Fisk University, a historically black college in Nashville. The same year she married Kenneth C. Adam in the gynecologist. He was later at the center of the landmark abortion case, convicted of manslaughter and formally acquitted on the appeal after performing a legal abortion in Boston in 1973. She and Dr. Edelman separated that year and later divorced, although she publicly defended him during the abortion case. Wow, this is amazing history. Almost done. Dr. Edelman completed a master's degree from the University of East Anglia in England in 1969, while her husband was stationed nearby during a stint with the U.S. Air Force. She completed her doctorate at Boston University in 1981, a few years later, leaving the faculty at Northeastern. The university honored her last year with the creation of Ramona Edelin Award for Academic Achievement in African Studies, the latest name for the department she once led. Survivors include two children from her marriage, Kenneth Edelin Jr. and Kimberly Freeman, a son, Ramad Spate, from a subsequent relation with Alonzo Spate, eight grandchildren and a great granddaughter and she delved into advocacy and activism looking to shape a political agenda that would move us forward and reclaim our children as she put it dr edelman continues to reflect on the work of dubois and social ethic had been subject of her dissertation she told the la times in 1989 that dubois had been right had been as right as a prophet in predicting that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line but it is up to us you continue to be sure that it's not the problem of the 21st century i enjoy reading that i didn't know about her i'm sorry it took so long but i didn't know about her and i had to learn about her and all it takes is a little bit of reading to learn history something people don't want to do so she was cr critical in the first abortion in Boston in the 1970s and connecting so-called Black Americans with their African ancestry and was forefront in being able to politically name the people in America called African Americans or Black. And she worked directly for the government, for the U.S. Congress, and under Hillary Clinton, and uh, she went to school in England, in England, in Anglia, and African-American under their watch 
is very, very scrutinized because we're not sure if African American means a English person with with melanin. We don't. We're not sure. We don't know what an African American is, but we know they coined it. So that means that people here wasn't always using it, and we don't know who we're dealing with. So let's go to the next phase of this video. That was great right there. Okay, we got politically African American still keeps us denationalized. Okay. Is that it? All right, hopefully that static is going away. I hope the static is going away. Hopefully. All right, let's go to Putin. All right, let's go in here. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm not going to play these videos because there's several videos rotating through TikTok and YouTube. There's rotating through YouTube of Putin talking while showing these so-called pictures. But I'm not convinced that he's saying what they're saying he's saying. So what does this mean? What this mean is he says they're a thousand years old. They're thousands of years old. Hold on one second. My sharing the screen. All right, I'm back. Okay, so Putin really didn't show nothing. We didn't see anything, really. I'm trying to get a mic check right quick. Hold on. One second. Uh, that's clear. That's clear. That's clear as it's going to get right there. So, hold on. I think I got some little images we can look up right here. Let's go here. I got a few images we can look at while I break Putin down. Everybody talking about Diddy like I'm a goofy. Like, you are, we already know Diddy. Is doing what did he do? Like we supposed to be shocked. Okay. So I'm not talking about Diddy. I'm not talking about them dudes, man. I'm not black African American. I'm just reporting on the news. So I'm not into that culture why I care about the psyop. But Putin is showing these pictures. And you know, is it a chess move? You know what I'm saying? Is it a chess move? What is he showing for? Because I don't see nothing. 
that we haven't seen already. I don't see nothing that we haven't seen already. You know what I mean? Nothing new. And him showing that pic- those those pictures is what he's taunting the West. What he's taunting the Americans like, okay, your pictures are fake. My pictures are real. Your your pictures are fake. My pictures are real. Type situation. You know, and it's really meddling. And a lot of people thinking he's some type of hero. And I don't think that's what he's doing. I don't think he's causing confusion like that. I think religious fanatics is using AI and they're voicing over his voice, his Russian words, and, you know, making it say what they want him to say. I don't think he's saying nothing about, oh, he's exposing the old, you know, religion. So I think it's all a part of the plot, like P. Diddy. So there's a there's a Russian. Let's go ahead and expose P. I should have put P. Diddy in the uh in the timeline. It's a it's a Roman emperor named after P. Didymus. So let's go and get it. Let's go and look that up right quick. Roman, this the Roman. This the Roman emperors. Okay, let's go here. It's actually a Roman emperor named P. Diddy. Okay, Augustus. We're going to go back to uh, <clears throat> Putin in a minute because a lot of this is connected, whether we like it or not. A lot of this is connected with a lot of these wars. Okay, Galba, Vitellius, Vespasian, Nerva, Trajan. I know for a fact one of these. Here, go right here. Didius. Didius Julianus. Didius Julianus. P. Diddy. You feel what I'm saying? Marcus Didius Julianus. <laughs> so Putin showing these pictures to me is sort of a it's a it's a media grab. It's a grab at the media because they know people is going to talk about it. And, you know, people out here, they, you know, they want to believe in Jesus. They want to believe somebody was trying to save them anyway. You know. So last but not least on the topic stream, let's go to the Moore's Gate in Alaska. So here it is right here. I'm going to go over this right quick. I'm going to go over this right quick, which we need to. And I'm probably going to mention this on tiktok because a lot of people don't know how much this history affects them in america because ancient american seafarers old world seafarers called the caliphate ruled the world and they this is their design right here and they try to call it islamic so before i go into this alaska mosque and dome of the rock which are two different things I'm going to read something for you. I'm going to go over some history. Okay. Let's go over some history. Shout out to Shaka Zulu if you didn't see the Shaka Zulu movie. You know, with that cap on that we see the natives wearing. So let's go over this right quick. A where Islamic Astrolog help Muslim Jews and Christians tell time and read horoscope. So a rare Islamic. So Islamic in this sense is different than Muslim Jews and Christian. Islamic stand on its own. So what is Islamic? Islamic would be the institution. 
the members are called Muslim Jews and Christians because Islam allows all three of them to be present. So Islamic institution is different. Muslim and Islam don't go hand in hand. They are just members or students, just like Jews and Christians. So the Islamic instrument will just go back to the Jerusalemic, Jerusalemic, Jerusalem. So I'm giving note to this because this is directly going to the Islamic seafarers who was whose works are considered advanced right now today. So look at this. This astrolabe shows the Hebrew inscribed above Arabic. So when we're dealing with Hebrew and Arabic at the time, same time, we're talking about Aramaic and Moabitic whenever we see them both present. So it's not Hebrew. It's Hebrew actually borrows from Moab script because Moab is a real being. Hebrew is not a real being. Moab and the R of Moab. So let me give you a, a gift on this since we're covering this part of the video, the Moors Gate. Right? Because I already went over the, the Putin's. If you thought I was finna babysit a topic on Putin, you got me wrong because it's all television. Anything on television has to be questioned. So let's get right here before I go into the Moors Gate in Alaska and read this language properly and understand what we're looking at. So this Hebrew inscribed on top of Arabic will go back to the R of Moab. It's where we get this word Arabian from. R means city, because I always teach y'all when I go over this. R equals city is an ancient city of Moab. So when you're dealing with Arabia or Ramic, it's the city, Arkansas. Um, um, uh, it's other words, Arizona. You understand what I'm saying? Aryan. When you see this R, it's city, it means it means civilized, not nomadic, ancient city of Moab. So when you see the Hebrew next to it, we're dealing with the Moabitic time. So why, what I'm showing you is um, attributing this rare Islamic astrolabe to a certain people where you won't have to guess what type of people it is. And they're just giving you a general explanation saying Muslim, Jews, and Christians till time. So let's go and look at this work of art that is not easy to du duplicate right now today. Right now today, these time measurements. Let's look at that and we can read up on it to get them their credit. Now, the stars that twinkled over medieval Verona, so that will show you the Islamic people's presence was a dominating presence even in Verona, have long been known for tragically entangling two young lovers in Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. Now a rare Islamic astrolabe that was recently rediscovered in that Italian city tells an equally riveting story about real stargazers who look up at those skies. The circular astrolabe, which is about 19 centimeters across, is particularly remarkable for the multilingual annotations etched directly into brass surface, revealing the instrument's journey from Mus Muslim ruled 11th century Spain, or what we call Andalus, to an Enlightenment era nobleman's collection of curiosities over its roughly 1,000 year history to device help its users till time and determine cardinal directions from the stars as well as read their horoscopes. It is quintessentially beautiful that you can just handle all these layers of history and science in such a small object, says University of Cambridge. Historian Federica Degante, who found the object last summer in a private collection of 17th century Veronese noblemen, Ludovico Moscardo, Astrolobes like this one are made up of rotating parts that depict a two-dimensional model of the heavens etched into the thin disc called a plate are two sets of concentric circles, one set of stereographic projection of Earth with the North Pole at the center. 
The circles radiating from the pole indicate specific latitudes moving outward from the Tropic of Cancer to the equator to the Tropic of Capricorn at the plate's rim. This is amazing. And I want to note that if anybody would know if the planet is flat or globe, it would have been these people right here. They held this very important knowledge and we can see the duality and civilization why they always try to put jews with muslims because of devices like this a device like this they would try to etch hebrew into it to act as if we were hand in hand in technology jews and muslim but this is not correct because the caliphate actually get their language of our the moabitic script aramaic from the West, Ptolemaic from the West, Hyardic from the West, Kufic from the rest. Others, they as workers and shopkeepers learn the language on their own. And at this time, and develop their own Creoles, but the script remains Kufic. It's called Kufic and Hijazi script, and there's other languages in the east of Mashriki. We look up Mashriki script and Maghribi script. So we can move on from this. I just wanted to give them credit before I go on on this story. Now, we can see Alaska Mosque and Dome of the Rock are two different things, and the fact that we got to tell people that is showing you that people are not understanding, understanding real heritage. Alaska Mosque and Dome of the Rock, let's uh, zoom in for this, are two separate things that most people mix up. Today we're coming up with a blog that clarifies the difference between these two places. There is a lot of confusion be between lots of things, places and many more. And many more. And the confusion between Masjid, Alaska, and the Dome of the Rock is one of them. Most people say both are the same places because they are located in the same city, but we should know that Islamic history is different for both. Difference between Alaska Mosque and Dome of the Rock is we can see the dome is the gold building. The Masjid Alaska is the silver building. Did you know whenever something about Masjid Alaska is mentioned by the media that they show the picture of the Dome of the Rock instead of the picture of Masjid Alaska, as many Muslims think that the Golden Dome is Masjid Alaska. This is a well thought out plan of certain people in the media. They want to mislead you to believe that the Dome of the Rock is Masjid Alaska. So when they attempt to remove Alaska, nobody will know, nobody will really care because they're already grooming you to not take notice. There's a difference between Masjid Alaska and the Dome of the Rock. Please know the difference. But if they plan and the creator plans and the creator is the best of planners for the sake of positivity. So here we are going to explain the history of both to let you know that both have different places in history. al aqsa Mosque. al aqsa Mosque is known as Bayit el Muqaddis. This mosque is located in Jerusalem, the old city. The old city, so we're talking old and laws, the old world. It was the first Qibla of the Muslims before Mecca. So this is architecture before Mecca and the Prophet Muhammad. It is the holiest place for Muslims and people of other religions as well. It was built by Suleiman. The al Aska Mosque is located on the Temple Mount, referred to by Muslims today as the Haram al-Sharif, with silver dome and four minarets. Our Prophet visited mirage from this mosque and ella says in quran glorified be allah who took his servant muhammad for journey by night from al masjid al Haraim at mecca to al masjid alaska the neighborhood where of we have blessed in order that we might show him of our ayah proof evidence lesson since verily he is the all here all seer dome of the rock the Dome of the Rock is also known as Kubat as Sakra, is an Islamic shrine located on Temple Mount in the old city of Jerusalem. The Dome of the Rock was built by the Caliph Abd al Malik Ibn Marwan in 72 AH. However, both these buildings are within the enclosure of Haraim as Sharif, 
the noble sanctuary, referred to as the furthest mosque. In Surah al-Isra, verse Mujir ad din al-Hanabali, in his book Al-Lans al-Jalil, writes that it is common amongst the people that Aqsa is the one located towards the Qibla. The mosque constructed in the foremost area, including the pulpit and the big merab or prayer niche, while the truth is that the Aqsa is the name of all what is within its compound inside the walls, the buildings, or the foremost area, and others don't want to rock corridors, and others, the Aqsa means all that is within the walls. So the whole plateau is called Aqsa. That's why people can't distinguish between both of them. Both are different buildings of different structures, and both are in Haram Sharif. And me, to be honest, I think that Harlem, New York, has a lot to do with these particular people because even though this video is not about that, Harlem fought with Moroccans in World War I and with French, right? So when we look at the Fillmore District in San Francisco, we can see it is called, let's get a zoom in on the Fillmore District, which is, I think it's near the Barbary Coast. Its nicknames is the Fillmo, the Mo. See the Fillmo, that's a slang word. See, we use slang and we see that word Gary, like Gary, Indiana. That word Najir and Gare follows us in history in Missouri as well. And here's a typical building of the American type. It's the Mo, and it's called the Mighty West Side and the Harlem of the West. See, that's why I wanted to mention that Harlem and why we have these celebrations in America that is exotic and, you know, full of gypsum. Eastern Oriental Turkic familiarities. The Fillmore District is a historical neighborhood in San Francisco, located to the southwest of Nob Hill, west of the Market Street, and north of Mission District. It's been given various names as the Mo or the Field. The Fillmore District began to rise to prominence after the 1906 earthquake. As a result of not being affected by the earthquake itself, nor the large fires that ensued, it quickly became one of the most commercial, one of the major commercial cultural centers of the city. It was indestructible. So whoever built this, they knew what they were doing because it survived the earthquake and the fires. After the earthquake, the district experienced a large influx of diverse ethnic population. It began to hard house large numbers of African-Americans, Japanese and Jews, each group significantly contributed to the local culture and earned the Fillmore District a reputation for being one of the most diverse neighborhoods in San Francisco. In particular, the district was known for having the largest jazz scene on the West Coast of the United States. So a neighborhood committed to Moorish people and even Japanese and Jews they sang jazz. So we can also attribute Zydeco music, Zydeco played by the Mexicans, and jazz. We see why so many Japanese people and Asian people use our music because they are used to it. They've been practicing it. So the district was known for having the largest jazz scene on the West Coast up until its decline in the 1970s. A large Japan town was also historically located in the Fillmore District, although technically it does not lie within the borders of the district today. But there is a history. During the 60s and 70s, the district underwent a large scale redevelopment. This led to the decline of the jazz scene in the area. However, there are claims that jazz in the district has rebounded. The redevelopment of Fillmore remains a controversial issue. Many of the forced to move from the district call it redevelopment a negro removal and a product of racism i don't know how a city you know that they built could be a product of racism if they built it i don't i have no idea how that worked 
if you build this city and you're responsible for the economy, how could you can be racially removed? I would like to talk about that. Anybody, I think I'll drop the link for that. I don't understand. I just wanted to talk about this and how this culture, uh, the Fillmore District dedicated to a Moorish people, how legally are these people being ostracized? And maybe um, this is why they're talking about giving these people reparations in California. Now, here's the Barbary Coast that is known on the east coast of America and the, the west coast of Africa. We also have a Barbary Coast. We have two Barbary Coasts in America, actually. We have one in San Francisco, and we have one down by Florida, areas that's actually called the Barbary Coast. So here it is right here, Chinatown, dance halls, jazz. So, it, it, you know, the American culture, it's the Barbary Coast, it's the California and it's so much going on. Look at the boats that they're having back then, the steamboats. So they have steamboats. That means these people are, you know, you know, they're going far distances. This is the, you know, this is the Barbary Coast. Look, Louisiana. Allah, look at that word, Allah, right there. Allah, California. So I, don't, I wish y'all can zoom in on that. I don't think we can zoom in. Let's see. They need to see that. You see it right here. A L L A Allah. So ain't no, it's there no telling what we're dealing because they're not documenting this type of history like per se the Christianity cultures, other cultures, and Hollywood typical mainstream cultures. They're not documenting this, but it's so much going on out here as we can see the dance halls and the jazz clubs so we can just pretty much envision who's out here in the in the barbary coast with all of this jazz you know culture but look boss politics so more than likely we're dealing with all types of gangsterisms similar to chicago and right here it says something about opium dens with the chinese so, oh boy, I, I, this is Wikipedia. I'm not going to go all the way in from Wikipedia, but we're getting an idea of this Barbary Coast and, pro, and prohibition. Why prohibition was tantamount? Why prohibition was tantamount? So here's a jazz pianist and composer. So we have, like I say, we have the Barbary Coast, San Francisco, and just like Fillmore District, we have the American type. Well, we call the Aborigine type. That, that, that's what they're calling them now. They're the Aborigine type. That's, they're, they, they're, not, they're called African American, you know, based off Edelin, Ramona. Ramona Edelin, what I was talking about earlier in the video. That is the newly adopted term. But in this time, it was the Barbary Coast. And we associate Barbary with Asiatic people called Muslim. Um, the Caliphate, right? It's so much. And like I say, they're connecting it with brothels, saloons, concert bars, having fun. You know, shout out to our Neil Bay. And like I say, I don't want to overemphasize. I just want to quickly paint the picture. Look at this, the Sydney town. Remember, there's a Sydney in Australia. So there's a Sydney, Australia. So these very same free people could very well have access to Australia with their steamboats. We don't know what's going on on the West besides they're calling it the wild, wild West. And they had to um occupy it from mexico with the mexican session so look at this right here district defined borrowed from the barbary coast of north africa where local pirates so it's the term is directly borrowing from the barbary coast of africa they're con they're connecting it and this is just too coincidental 
from Mexico to California, all the way back to Chicago. In the South, we have too many of these connections that we can go on through the Civil War, pre-Civil War, and uh, antebellum. So I want to end it like that. Let me see how many minutes we've been uh, live. Uh, this has actually been 44 minutes. This hasn't been that long like I anticipated. But that was enough research and compacted in 40-something minutes. We was able to go over all three topics. And I'm up for questions. I understand it's late. It was actually a power outage out in my town. I was going to go live at midnight. But I'm like, yo, I'm not going to not go live. Because I said I was going to go live. So I'm sorry that it's so late. But the people who was in here the other day, I appreciate y'all. I didn't see y'all come out today. If you guys who just subscribed do see this video, remember I said I'm going to be going live at midnight every other night or as often as possible. The Midnight Club. Right. So be there next time. If you, you know, said you were just let's just start doing these builds. I had Omi Bay in here and a couple of other the brothers and sisters up in here dropping some science. And uh, this is what we can build. I want to do the midnight hour for now on. And uh, drop information like this. So uh, we went over Alaska. What's the difference between Alaska mosque and the dome of the, and the dome? I don't even think we got an image of the gate of the moors. I'm sorry. That's what we have to do. We have to have an image of the gate of the moors because it's not the entire video, but I still want to give an image because I'm going to do that before the eclipse. So here's here's a understanding of what I think Putin is up to. Because it is a common agreement not to talk about uh, the gate. Remember the old world gate and the Temple Mount? We just talked about Alaska and the Dome of the Rock. And this is the gate of the Moors. As you can see right here, the Moors are an intricate group of people that's a part of Jerusalem and Islam. And the building of the uh the excavation of this area the moors gate right here the moors are certain people and they say it's an exonym moors is not an exonym it is a shortened word for uh the moroccans the moros are a real people that is global and their history still exists right now today, once occupied by the remnants of so-called Spain, which I will be explaining exactly what Spain is on a later video. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you understand what Spain is. But before I do that, let me read on the Moors Gate because I actually have a book. So let's go on here on what Spain is, and a lot of people don't quite understand what Spain is. So Spain, when we look at the dog Spaniel, it's called the Spaniel, Cocker Spaniel. Look at the hair. So it, this was a hairdo that the Spanish wore. It was a curly hairdo, and they were known for it. The Spaniel, you see the curls right here. This is where we get the term Spanish from. The people who were mulattoes and mestizos, first generation Spaniels. So it's a word like China. It's a word like Cheyenne and Chino. Spaniel means dog. So you really don't understand what they mean by Spanish. They mean the dogs of war. And we're going to go over that on a later day, like I said, because a lot of people don't know these things. And they just uh, teach what they know. So we're going to go over that. But let's go back uh, to what I was just talking about. Let's go back and end it with that. The gate to the Temple Mount. Like I said, I had a book I've been reading. That's why I wasn't too quick to read on this and there's got to be some corrections but let's go right here let's start here the moors gate also known as the magarib magarib 
Magariba, Gariba, like Gari, like Garafuna, Megarib Gate, Bab El Magariba, Ashair, Ha Murabim is the southernmost gate of the west flank of the compound built directly of the Herodian period gate, known as the Gate of the Prophet. It is believed that the current gate was built during the IUB period and renovated and connected to the west section of the compounding during the Mameluk rule. The gate was constructed around the time of the Ubits, Indo, the quarter to the North Africans and Moors of Andalusia and the Malachites who were living side by side in Jerusalem. So I just wanted to document that the Malachites, the Andalusians, North Africans and Moors. So these were their quarters, and we're going to get to the nitty-gritty on who they are and Macariba, who I believe are the Caribbean, or what we call Maroon, the Maroons today, the Maroons today. I believe the Magaribans are the, uh, what they say, Reuben, Ribbon, Reuben. All of that is is all similar, but is the Caribbeans today. These communities were called in Maghribic language, lived in that area, and so they were dispersed with the quarters demolition in 1967 by Israel in order to construct the West Wall Plaza for the Jews to pray. So for Jews to pray, they destroyed this historic site. Some 130 homes were destroyed, displacing North African inhabitants who came and settled in the area since the time of Saladin. So they chased away some very ancient people. And I believe Israel did release a, an apology. I believe they did, but we don't know if the people were properly remedied. Over the years, the ground level of the Maghribi Gate rose by many meters above its threshold in the gates of the Prophet was finally walled up in the 10th century. At some stage, a new gate called Bab al Magariba was installed in all Burak wall. The Burak wall above the gate of the prophet at the level of the compound Esplanade, it was named after the residents of the adjacent neighborhood who had come to the Jerusalem from the grave in the days of Saladin. This gate is open to this day since 67. It has been an entrance to Alaska Mosque accessible to non-Muslims only. Muslims have been banned from using this gate since 1967. That is very important to know. And we want to understand why. Because as Americans, we can go here. Nobody can tell us we can't go here as Americans. Although it could be dangerous because we're not from there. But... As Americans, our status allows us to go and find out what's going on here. And even though there is a constant warfare over there, it would be dangerous. It would be our best interest to find out, being that we are descendants of the Caliphate. The Umayyad Caliphate, to be exact, we are direct descendants. Although the keys of Alaska compounds are, are the property of the Islamic Waf organization, the keys of Al Maghriba Gate were seized by Israel in 1967 and continued in their possession today. That is a problem. We must find out why, if we are true Moorish American, because we have every right to find out because of the word Morocco and Moors is our inheritance. The word Maghrib and Maghriba is our wording. But now that they're dealing with these people, Hamas, who I believe means the Moors, because Ha means black and Maz means more. That's what I believe it is. And I'll leave it at that for the sake of the sake of this video. I'll leave it at that. But it's something going on over there that affects us over here, especially the people in the Muscogee area, Georgia, Carolina area, Florida. This affects us because as these people lost their way, we were over here losing our way in 1967 and 1968. And prior to that, whenever these people was going through something, we was going through something over here. So we have to investigate this and why it's very difficult for us to be ourselves and practice our old world religion, our old time religion. There seems to be a problem with that. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm, I don't know if y'all want to ask questions. 
I don't, I'm not sure if you do. Feel free. I'm here for that. But I think I pretty much painted the picture and I used three different topics, what I'm known for. I tackled three important topics in one video that you should talk about, how I feel about Putin, how I think about the Moors Gate in Alaska and the Dome of the Rock, how it plays in our history. It's Muslim in America and uh, Adelin, Ramona Adelin, the woman who pushed for the term African America and not Black American or Negro. She wanted to be African American so you can attach yourself to Africa. Why is that important? Why did the elites of the culture want us to adopt the term Africa America and not Black or more? We need to know that. And as I lead the forefront in this generation for answers, you need to help me and you know, push for these matters to be uh, explained because we have inheritance. We are not just here for no reason. You know, if the first Americans, our ancestors are the first people to build America from the bricks, from the rocks, then that means we should never in our lives be broke. We should never economically struggle if our ancestors took part in building this wonderful nation. We should never ever struggle. That's why we gotta always have a voice. We gotta always speak. We got to always represent. We got to always be there for each other on each coast. From the Great Lakes, from the Gulf Coast, the East Coast, all the way to the West Coast and the islands. We have to command a network and keep it fresh. So I did drop the link and I don't see that, that crowd from last time who wanted to chop it up with me, but. Yeah, I will go live tomorrow to make up for the lost time and see if I can get y'all back up in here and go check out my TikTok and Mariko Niore and Instagram uh, is Aboriginal Lord and Savior on Instagram. Hell, let me write it correctly. It's Aborigine underscore. Lord and Savior on Instagram. Bro, history news, history, live event coming at you, you know, midnight. Well, we got it. We really talk about, you know, this channel talk about topics that, you know, most people are afraid or they can't, you know, you know, certain things like reading properly and comprehending. It takes, you know, experts to talk about certain issues like that. So I understand that, you know, people don't want to go into that, but that's what I do over here. The email is IllinoisAmerican at gmail.com. You know, a citizen of Illinois. I'm an American by default, by birthright. And we rep to the full, the Mississippian culture. We show love. We try to show love over here. Since we started our publications, 2013, we showing love over here, man. You know, from the south up to the north, we linking everybody up. You know, of the royal families, lawing and drawing. So I uh, appreciate y'all supporting me. You know what the cash app is. You know how to get up with me if you want to keep it popping. You know what I mean. We're all with us. Heaven on earth. Warrior family. You want to get in tune with your dreams. I'm Lauren and John. You want to get in tune with this universe. Let the vibe manifest. I'll put you in tune. Lauren and John up that third eye. It be so beautiful out here. You know what I'm saying? Lauren and John. Everything peaceful. You know what I'm saying? Lauren and John, that divine creed. Man. You know what I'm saying? We be in rotation. Damn, big glow. You did that? Everything beautiful. My life would be lit. I'd be deep in this lit. It's a heavenly life. It's some tea in this is. Paradise living. We manifest heaven. So future and direct. It's the life that I live. Baby, if you want to roll with a king, it's a beautiful thing when I summon your dreams. Deep on the scene like we shooting the scene. Baby, you see this American dream. I'm the Allah, Allah, Akbar. I pray to Allah and I'm all of our cream. For 